Good morning, everyone. I'm John Overstrom. I want to welcome you to my uh, workshop. Today, I'm going to be talking about uh, caning chairs. I'm going to go through some of the history of caning chairs and, uh, the, and show you how to the basic steps to uh, cane a chair and talk about how, how you can get supplies and things like that. Before we get started, I want to show you just so we have a common understanding of what I'm talking about. This is a chair I caned, I completed it about a week ago. And you can see that it has the pattern we've all seen for years. It's basically a six strand weave with two verticals, two horizontals, and a couple of diagonals going across. Uh, a hand uh, woven chair will always have a perimeter of holes around it. Uh, and on the underside of it, you'll have a series of knots and loops that are used to tie off, uh, knots to tie off the ends of the strands and the loops will be uh, coming through the holes. So that's typical of a hand-woven chair. Uh, and that's what I'm gonna be talking about doing today. Uh, so I first learned of weaving chairs or caning chairs from my grandfather uh, as a, uh, retirement hobby, he took up furniture reconditioning and refinishing. Uh, he would go around the, uh, he lived the, the, in the summers, they were in the Connecticut River Valley, and he would go to New Hampshire and Vermont, he'd go to various uh, uh, yard sales and auctions and pick up old pieces of furniture. Chairs kind of fell into that, and uh, he had picked up a whole lot of chairs and refurbished those and then came to seats. And Cindy and I have acquired uh, six of those chairs uh, that he did. And uh, well, he was doing that back in the 1960s and the seats only last so long before you're gonna to have to recane them. So our chairs, I did some about 10 years ago, I did three. And then uh, now they're, the rest of them are starting to go too. So I can say at this point in time, I've only done four chairs. So you don't really wanna consider me the world expert on this, but uh, at least I've done enough to uh, gain some experience. And uh, I did that one recently to refresh myself so that I could do this talk. I'm gonna finish off the other two, uh, or yeah, the other two that I've got left, and then uh, probably not do it again for a long time. So um, the, uh, let's see. So how long have people been using this particular pattern? As it turns out, we don't actually know. There are samples of this pattern and chairs that have been caned that have been found in uh, tombs in Egypt and also in ancient archeological digs in China. So it's been with us for a long time. Uh, it was introduced to Europe in the 1600s by Dutch trades with the Far East and they brought it to Europe and it took off, became very popular in Europe with the wealthy people that could afford this foreign material, basically. They liked the chairs because they were lighter weight than a solid wood chair. And they were also more uh, cleaner. You know, they, they didn't have the fabric cushion. They didn't hold mites and dirt as much. They could be easily cleaned. And so they were considered more hygienic than a regular chair that they had. So they, it became very popular in the 1600s and 1700s and made its way to the colonial, uh, colonial America in those same time frames. So a lot of people or richer people would have these chairs as kind of a little bit of status thing. So in the 1800s, uh, the, uh, with the Industrial Revolution, it became possible to make all of the wooden parts of the chair in a factory environment and they could knock out the wooden parts fairly quickly with lathes and power tools and things that they use with a steam driven or, or mill driven factory, but they could not weave the seats in a, that kind of environment. So it developed a cottage industry within the United States where the factories would make these wooden pieces and then ship them out to and literally farm them out to people and they would do this. And you, you think about it, you'd have a whole farm family sitting around all winter long with no crops to tend. And hey, you might as well put them all to work. Uh, and so you could have the entire family 
you know, it's doing the weaving all day long, weaving the chair all day long. And uh, there was a picture online of a farm wagon loaded at least 10 feet high with chairs mm -hmm. that they have made then taking them into, you know, back to sell. And I, so I'm sure there was some relationship where the frames were provided and they got them back. The, so you consider that they became very popular in the mid 1800s. And you think about these chair cane, the cane seats only last so long. So the, you, by the late 1800s, those chairs were starting to go bad. So the typical person's gonna take that seat, remove it, put a small piece of plywood or something, nail it in, and or maybe drill holes in it and uh, kind of replicate what was there with plywood. And you'll see a lot of old chairs that were done that way. But manufacturers also came up with the idea that, hey, there's this market out there. They started making fiber seats and basically pressed paper fiberboard seats that you'll see on some of these chairs. And they would typically have a circle of tacks around the outside of the chair that was used to hold this fiber seat in place. And usually it would have an embossed pattern on the top. Uh, and, um, and it looked you know, kind of like leather. And those seats are actually, those fiberboard seats are actually still available today if you wanted to do that as far as a replacement. I can show you on this chair here, you can see some, uh, especially over in here, oh, yeah. a series of nail holes around the edge. And unfortunately, if a chair was converted, and all of, the, all of this set of chairs that I have has that, was, that was done to it. And uh, so it, it unfortunately weakens the frame. And so this side I've had to reinforce, my grandfather had to replace this rail back here because I suppose it was split too bad too badly to reuse. So it's, it was a problem if you have a chair that had that done to it, it may require some more special work. Uh, let's see. So this pattern's been around for thousands of years and it's never gone away. It's kind of comes in and out of vogue, uh, but not, uh, you know, it's never really gone, gone away. Other thing I should say is by the late 1800s, a machine was developed to uh, weave this pattern in a factory environment. So it no longer required people to do the hand weaving, but um, th that's not the, not the process I'm gonna be talking about today. I'm gonna to be talking about doing it uh, yourself uh, by hand. So what is the cane? The cane is actually the outer layer of the rattan plant, which is a climbing uh, palm vine. And uh, they strip off the foliage and the, it's basically just the outer layer, almost like the bark layer that we're working with, and they cut it to various widths. Uh, and you'll find online that there's a, there are uh, various names for those widths. And it's odd, kind of, kind of old school. They're, the names for these widths are uh, common, medium, narrow, uh, nar narrow, medium, fine, 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 and super fine. And I've also come across another brain level of called carriage. So it's like carriage fine and carriage fine fine. This is like this very old naming of, the, of these things. Um, so you have that level of cane and you also have a little bit wider cane that is used for the, as the binder cane that goes around the perimeter to mask those holes that, that are there. So, um, what are these materials? If you, if you want to do this yourself, uh, my recommendation is that you buy a kit. Uh, if you order a kit, it comes with several things and pretty much everything you need to need to do the job. So this is a book, a little booklet that comes with it. For about $22, you get a booklet, you get about six of these pegs that are used. You'll get and all, and this is the binder cane. And the other thing you'll get, I'm stepping off camera, is this. This 
is a loop of the regular cane. This is a thousand, was a thousand feet when I got it. This is a loop of cane and you can see it's a kind of a, a monster. You don't really want to let this thing free and undo all of it at once or you will never get it back. So I've basically undid one knot down here and I slid the other knots up. They just have it tied with, uh, tied with twine or with string, uh, but you do not want to unleash this thing on yourself. And the other thing is this has been baked uh, in a kiln probably or oven to dry it out before they ship it so that it doesn't have uh, uh, any mildewing going on while it's in shipment but it's dry as a bone and uh, pretty brittle. I mean, not brittle like a stick, it won't break, but you'll damage the fibers if you bend it. So you really need to be very careful about stepping on it or pulling too hard on it when it's in this state. So until it's put in a water bath, uh, it's not, you know, it's, it's kind of vulnerable. So you really have to treat it with some respect. What other tools do you need? And there's not too much. You need clothes pins, maybe eight or so clothes pins. Uh, I use wire, a you know, cheap pair of wire cutters. Uh, I also use an ice pick because I'll show you why, but the, uh, the taper on this is much better for uh, tying off the knots. Um, you can substitute, if you don't have the, enough pigs, you can use golf tees. Uh, I find these work, the, their pigs work a little bit better. And, um, the, uh, and it, to tell you the truth, I bought a set of these pegs, you get six for under $2. So it's not like you're breaking the bank to buy these things. So for around 20, $25 plus shipping, uh, you can get yourself a set, a, you know, the into everything you need pretty much. Besides that, you need a bucket of water and kind of a washcloth sized rag. Uh, some people use spray bottles, some people use um, sponge, but I prefer using a, a rag and also good to have a towel with you. Uh, let's see, let me check my notes and make sure we're doing okay. Uh, so as far as what would it cost to have done professionally, that usually it's around, the estimates I've seen is around $350 to do this commercially uh, and have pay somebody to do it. It's, there's a lot of hours involved. Uh, so that makes sense. Now, Judy Severson told me that she had one done by the blind uh, and I don't know what, what uh, charitable outlet it was, but for somewhere around thirty dollars. So oh, wow. I can say if you can find somebody that'll do it for thirty dollars, and they're a charitable organization, give them ninety, and both of you walk away a winner. You know, because <laughs> honestly, there it's it's and go find something else to do to pass the time in the winter because uh, certainly uh, they they need the money, and uh, it'd be great a great charitable donation. Um. So it takes me about a week to do a chair. Uh, I'd like to say that it was only six hours, but I, I don't think it is for me. Uh, I used to be faster, I'm sure. Uh, my back gets tired when I'm doing it. So I only do about an hour and a half a day. Uh, and I think I did the, like seven days of, six days of actual weaving. So it's, it's somewhere around eight to 10 hours that it takes to do, for me to do a chair. Um, Let's see. So let me move over to, I'm uh, trying to make sure that I, oh, I'll show you what the clothes pins are for before I move the camera. So when you coil up the, uh, when you get the cane ready to use, you wanna coil it up and clip it with one or two uh, clothes pins in order to have it, uh, stay in the bucket, otherwise it's hard to tame. So these will help you tame the strands and get them in the bucket and uh, keep them in control. Um, as far as the water, uh, there are some instructions you'll find that uh, will tell you to use warm water. Uh, my grandfather just always had a bucket sitting around. It's, it's a lot easier to have a room temperature bucket because 
Suppose you put warm water in there. Well, it's starting to get cool. How long are you going to leave the strands in there? How long? It, so if you have it the same temperature all the time and it's just room temperature, it's a lot easier to manage. And I've had these in here for a little bit, like an hour and a half now. Uh, the minimum I would do is 15 minutes for a brand new strand. But I find if, if I do it only 15 minutes, it's kind of, um, I'm trying to struggle to keep it moist enough. So probably a, if with brand new strands, I'd put it in for a half an hour. My grandfather, I think, left it in there forever. I don't think the I don't think that's a good idea, but I, he always seemed to have strands sitting in the bucket all the time. Um, let's see, what other points did I want to make? I should say my grandfather didn't actually teach me to do this. I watched him do it, but he never actually taught me how to do it. Oh, as far as working. I, I, you can see I've got this sitting on a workmate stand. This allows me to work standing up, but even standing up, I find that my back gets tired. So I might spend half of the day with it up here and half of the day sitting at, on, at a chair uh, down on the floor, you know, and, and with it in front of me. So I transition between the two. So it, because both of them hurt my back, but one of them hurts my back in a different spot than the other. <laughs> How long are the lengths that, that you soak in the chair? Do they tell you in the kit or do you just know? The, the lengths that you get will vary anywhere from about five, five feet to about 19 feet long. Uh, and I have taken them out and tried to roughly measure just by using my arms, you know, stretching my arm that lengths out about so I figure that's about five feet and then I will measure it that way and know how much I I've got at least um, the uh, you know it's a varied uh, set you want to you know I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what lengths you might want uh, actually coming up fairly soon um, so here's the chair before you start caning you want to have everything else completed on the chair the, the structure of the frame itself, the wooden of the seat of the chair itself needs to be sound. So you need to do that. The structure of the seat needs to be sound and you need to do that. The caning of the chair is the final step. I mean, you don't wanna try to paint after you've got the, or, or varnish after you've got the, uh, the seat on. So you, that's the last finishing step. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about the structural elements of the chair frame itself, but the seat frame I will. So as I said, the, there's problems when there's been, if there's been uh, nails, you look at this series of holes is right in line with the grain of the wood. And if you start putting nail holes in or in here, then it, we, so this already weakens the, uh, weakens the wood. And then you start putting nail holes in and they act like wedges and they will split out this wood. And if you're going to go from having those uh, composite seats that were nailed in to back to uh, uh, weaving, there's a lot of force that's generated from the strands across, and that will just pull that thing apart. So what I've found is if you put in two or three modern sheetrock screws, number six screws, they'll fit between the holes, and you can screw through there and reinforce that. And I've taken epoxy so you open the crack up as much as you can, take an epo epoxy, put it down in the crack, and then clamp it up with the screws. And that's pretty good. I have also taken a steel plate, a, a strap iron from, that I've, you know, from the hardware store that I've cut and drilled, and used that and put screws through it. Um, so it's all, you know, you need to get the seat structurally sound. This particular chair, I had problems with the front rail so you can see that I've done basically what I'm talking about on in this corner and both these corners actually. And there's sheetrock screws through metal. Now I have a drill press, so it's easy for me to do those things. Um, so, but this particular seat doesn't have any of those problems. It's got, it's an oak frame. It's got a lot of distance here. So I'm in pretty good shape without having to worry about the seat. Uh, seat uh, cracking or anything. So how do we get started? Well, first off, let's count from the cent from the two corners, we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
and there's the center hole. So I'm gonna put a peg in the center hole. I'm gonna to come to the front, do the same thing. One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And that would be here. So there are the two center, the center points. Now in this case, there's a center strand. Some cases, in some cases, if it's even or odd number of holes, it'll change and there'll be two, you know, the, the center will be a gap. So this is where we would normally start. Now, why do we start here? We start here because the chair is symmetric about that center line. And so when I, I'm gonna start here and work my way to the right, and then after the right side is done, I'm gonna start and work the way to the left. And everything I do on the left side should mirror what I did on the right side. So we were kind of starting just to have that symmetry set up. It gets interesting when we get over to this side uh, because there are a lot of variability and this is kind of where the artwork starts to work in or what your desires or what you like starts to work into it. Um, I should say, here's a, another thing before we would start, you'll find that the typical failure on these chairs of the, of the cane is right in here because people tend to sit here in the forward in the seat and a lot of these chairs have a very sharp edge right here. So you want to go all the way around the perimeter of the seat and round those edges off. So I have taken a file and gone all the way around. My grandfather did it, but I did some more. And, and to go all the way around to make sure that's a smooth transition so you don't have any place where the uh, cane is getting sharply bent and increasing the stresses on it. And in, along the same lines, I have taken these holes and used a countersink to try to round off the tops. Actually, I didn't have to do that too much either because my grandfather had already done that. So that's a countersink you could use to round off the tops of the holes. You could also use a hand, you know, a hand countersink to do the same thing. So this piece I'm gonna be putting in, I know, is about seven feet long. <coughs> So I would normally start from this, the center and work my way to the right. But for today's demonstration, I am not doing that. Today's demonstration, I'm only going to do three uh, vertical and three horizontal strands and uh, so that I have time to do the entire seat. So I'm going to start to the left just to have my project today be centered. So what you do is you put the, uh, Put the strand down in. You leave yourself about four inches on the opposite side. And you see you hold the end of the strand because you're going to use the loops to tie off in the end. Uh, and so the uh, you can't tie off because there's nothing to tie to yet because we haven't established any loops. So now come across. The cane has a rounded side that's smooth and a coarse side. The rounded side at, is always at the top. And so we just come across there and we're gonna put the peg in. I'm not trying to make this taut. I, I mean, I don't want it to flop around like that. I'm just trying to get it pretty much straight across the whole, still a little bit of, of, of floppiness to it, but pretty much straight across. And um, because this is gonna get tighter, as it dries, it's gonna get tighter as we weave. So you don't wanna to do too much. So you don't wanna twist, obviously. Now, when I do this, I pull the strand. I'm gonna want that strand to come to the right, to the next hole. So I pull it to the right. And just to show you what I use this for is we have to kind of jealously protect the amount of space in the hole. So I put, my awl down in there and rotate it around to make sure that the strand smoothly lies against the side of the wall. You want it to make a smooth transition because it's trying to change directions as it goes down through there. And we're gonna pull it up through the next hole. And here it becomes important to have your, keep your hands on the strand at all times because you can stop a twist from occurring. 
So I'm going to pull this up through. And I sh should be coming out with the, the correct side on the top. And I can I put my finger under here to feel the smoothness, smoothness of that transition and make sure that that strand is actually staying uh, smooth against the bottom. That's going to be very helpful in the end to not have those knots bunch up too much. I'm going to put this in here and make it smooth up against the side. And that's it. So now I've got that one in. Now I'm going to come back here. And this chair has a little bit of an annoyance, and that's that the uh, there's a rail right there that prevents me from actually yeah. getting at underneath very easily. So now I get over here, I'm gonna move the peg. I'm gonna come up through over here. Now, Patty was asking about how uh, long the strand should be. On this one, you wanna make sure that this strand is going to be long enough to make it all the way across because there's nothing to tie to at this point in time when you're these early strands, we're about three steps in to the weaving process before we actually can uh, tie anything off. So you wanna make sure you make it as far as possible. So to do half the chair. To do half of the chair. Yeah, you need to get it across. In one direction. So that'd be like 13 or 14 feet, maybe 15 feet. You can figure that out by measuring, you know, how many holes and how many strands you've got, or counting how many holes you've got and how many strands you've got to come across. So I'm going to do this layer here and this one here. I'm going to, so I probably should have pegged there, but I didn't. I'm going to peg over here. So that is actually what I'm doing for today. Um, that's the first vertical. They call these the verticals. Now, and then these are the horizontals. So now that I've done that, um, I'm going to cut this off. This Normally, I just keep on going until I get to the side. But you remember when I counted the holes, there's more holes in the front than there are in the back. So when I get get to the end over here, I have to figure out what to do. Okay, I'm going to go back because I skipped, I fixed, skipped a step. Before you ever start working on the chair, you really want to save a copy of what it was that was done before. At least it's nice to be able to save a copy of what was done before. So you could take a photo. If you have uh, a set of chairs, you could, um, you could uh, use the other set as an example. But what I do is when I remove the seat from this chair, I cut all of those knots around the bottom and just punch, punch this seat back out. So I've got a copy of what, what my grandfather did here and I can exactly copy that. Um, that's cool. So that's my recommended method. And that way you've always got something to refer to. So imagine that we were over here. If I go uh, one more hole, one more. One, two, one. So if I put one here and here, here and here, the actual instructions tell you not to use this corner hole, but I can tell you that my grandfather did use the corner hole. So if we put a strand in there, and I don't know where it went to, I missed it. Suppose we work our way over to this spot. I'm going to switch pegs because that thing's down there stopping me. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So this strand from that I was working on over here is going to end either at the back here or up at the front. Now I have to decide, suppose it ended at the front, I have to decide where's that next one going to go. Now my grandfather decided to do it back here at the corner, which is where they 
tell you you're not supposed to do it. But I think he's right, personally, from what I see. So I'm probably, when I do do this chair, I'm going to complete, you're going to do what he did and use that hole. Because if I start using one of the other holes, you see it's getting, it's, you'd want to have these strands parallel. If I use one of these other holes in the side, it's not going to be parallel. So I will probably end up using that one. But now that I use that one, I'm still going to end up at some point over here with, I still have another hole to fill. So this ends up, if, I, if this strand ended back here, I'm going to have to put in a filler strand over here on the side. And so the selection of where that filler strand actually goes is kind of up to you in a sense. I'll use this. So the basic rule of thumb is that you don't want to block that it needs to be parallel to the next, to the other strand, about the same spacing as the other strand, but you also don't want it to be in an angle that's going to cover up the holes, too many of the other holes. So that probably is going to say that, that number one, it's going to go in this hole, and then you've got to pick a hole along the side that makes it parallel, you know, so it's probably going to be that hole there. But I can confirm that because I've got what my grandfather did as an example and see if I like what he did, I'll copy that. And if I don't, well, I, then I uh, might change it up. So I'm gonna take this away just to get it out of the way. Oop, move the camera. So next step, now, now I've got to start uh, weaving like crazy here. I'm gonna put, the next hor the first horizontal strand in, go across. I'm going to do basically the same thing. You've seen the process mostly. Um, and I'm just going to try to weave as fast as I can. It's going to be a lot sloppier maybe than it should be for a real the real job, but I'm just going to try to go quickly here. Um, one thing about the cane is that uh, I'll show you that later, actually. This king is uh, a brand new one. The others that I am using there are uh, 10 years old. So that's why they are darker than this new one. I've got a twist in it. Actually, I've got a twist down there underneath. So what I would have done on that first layer is I would have completed going to the right, then I would have gone to the left mirrored the image, the exact same strands I did, and how I did the, the, the one on the right would be how it looks on the left. Then I would start this horizontal layer, the first one that I'm doing, and I would have started it exactly where I started it, that I didn't do anything for this demo purpose. So now you can see I've got four squares here in the back, and that's going to be the four holes that are going to be the eyelet kind of thing with the that you see in the pattern. The next step is. So would you finish going all the way down then? Yeah, so I would, I would complete the first one. I would have done all the way to this side. Then I would have come to this side. Again, where you want to use as long a strand as possible for these first layers. For this one, I could just go all the way as long as the strand will go. I work my way up to the front. So maybe a 19 foot long one would actually get me all the way. I don't know. Uh, so. You could, you know, so you keep going out across horizontally till we get to the front. And now I'm going to do the third layer. The third layer is going to be on starting, going to be a forward and back or a vertical layer. I'm going to have the four inch long tail down here so that I can tie it off. I'm going to lie this one to the right. 
of the previous strand. I'm not doing any weaving yet. I'm just playing, laying a strand in. There you go. So that closes everything is a real pain. There. So I've, you know, let me get this strand in and explain this. So, so all we're doing there is we just end up with it looking kind of like the final product in a sense that you see another strand laying right next to that other one. And just to the right of it, I'm going to pull the next strand up. Now, if this seat happens to be flat, if the seat has a contour to it, meaning that it's got a curvature in this direction, then I would be doing it. Uh, I would have started the strands differently. And the reason for that is these, the, this cross layer that I, put in this, this cross layer would define the curvature of the seat. If I started strands, uh, vertical strands that I'm doing now first, then they'd be in midair across the top of, a, of the curved seat. And uh, so that's basically the, so that wouldn't be too good. The basic process is still the same. You just do the weaves in a little bit different order. And instead of putting weaves on top, like I'm doing here, you would put them on the, on the underneath the previous layer instead of on top of the layer, but still not weaving. So you would start the horizontal first? Yes. So you, if, with you, a curved you seat? go back and forth like this first. Okay. And then the first vertical, the vertical layer that I did first would go underneath it because that will then force those vertical strands to have the curvature of the wow. seat. That sounds like uh, like more more advanced. Well, it's not that hard. No. <laughs> You're just running the layer underneath and supposed to on top. You're still not weaving. OK. OK, so get this down in there. John, you had said to make sure that you use like a 19 foot strand or whatever. What happens if you run out partway through? On your uh, you just use another peg. At this point in time, you just use another peg. And, uh, and you know, you, eventually you get the chance to tie all these things off. Okay, thank you. And well, so in fact, let's step jump to that right now. I'll show you that process. So this is where I might need you to go around. Cindy. So you see now that I've done this, um, yeah, if you can hold that there. I have at this point in time, I've got two pegs underneath these holes and I've got two strands coming out. This one's an excessively long one. I'm gonna cut it off because I, I would have normally, this would have been the strand I would have continued weaving. So I've got to cut that off with the nippers and now I've got a loop here next to each of these and I've got a free end. So I'm gonna show you now how to tie off. This is where I like my smaller, there they go, oh, smaller uh, ice pick because you need to get underneath this strand and lift it up slightly and it's already quite tight. So if I get under there and then I'm gonna take the other end of the loop and push it in through there, right next to where that loop is. I'm done with the ice pick now. So I just pull it like that and I pull it tight. Now there are many chairs and the first chair that I did, I used overhand knots where I would have come into that loop. But you know what? It really is not the best way to do it. The best way to do it is just do this double loop. So I've wrapped around it twice and I'm gonna pull it taut. And you can see that, that that lays on very smooth and doesn't make any bulk there. Uh, so it makes a nicer looking thing. Then we just 
if it off with a little bit of excess. I'll do the other one just because we're here to show you again, a double, just a double wrap around it. And once you've done, got one strand under there, you can use the other one to lift up on the knot and help you do the knot. And there we go. Then we take the nippers and- You only did one loop, right? No, I did have two wraps okay. around, yeah. And that's it. Then, you, then, then when I turn it over, okay, well, good. Thank you. Then when I turn it over, there's, I don't need these pegs here anymore. Those pegs can all go away. Now you've seen most of the processes, except for weaving anything. So, I'm hoping I've got enough here. You can throw that back in the, in the bucket, right? This should be this one shorter, probably. That should be plenty. Okay, so. Now it's time to start an actual weave. The next layer is the first actual woven layer. I'm weaving. Let me explain something. The, these strands, there's joints where the foliage was attached to these strands. And for this part, since I'm not really weaving anything and trying to draw anything through, it doesn't matter. But there are notches in these strands. So you want to take your fingernail and pull along and see which way the fiber would like you to pull it. This one would like, you know, there's a little bit of a more of a bind if I pull it that way than if I pull it that way. Many, some of them it really, and this one probably doesn't matter that much, but it's a good thing to do it the way the, you know, the strand will not object to your doing it. So it's good to just run your fingernail over. Some of them, it doesn't matter at all. But on this one, I'd say I'd do it to, to make sure. So I'm going to start on the opposite hole this time, again, because if I did it, if I started the same spot I started over here, I don't have enough, I'm, I want to generate more loops underneath. And the loop for this first strand that I put in is under here. This side doesn't have a loop. So when I pull this, get this strand over there and pull it up out the next hole, out of the next hole, then I'm going to have a loop and I'll have more places to tie off. So you want to get your, that's why we're doing it from the opposite side. Now weaving is typically, you know, you, any, I always kind of view weaving as being uh, that, so how do you want, know where to go? Well, there's instructions in those manuals to tell you, but my, for this first one, it's kind of easy because I just say, well, if something else is pushing it up, you want to push it down. And if something else is pushing it down, you want to put, push it up. You're always kind of fighting what the strand next to you is doing. So I, the other one is under, so I'm gonna go over. The other one is under, so I'm gonna, you know, over, then I'm gonna go you know, under. So that's basically what I'm doing. Uh, and coming across. Yeah, your hand's in the way. Yeah, I know my hand's gonna be in the way. But <clears throat> over, under, over, under. That, then there's the mantra of the weaver, over, under, over, under, over, under. They just keep over, under, over, under. Okay, so that's all of the weaving that I need to do on this. I'm gonna pull it across. Now, when, when you actually have a whole chair full, it's, um, you know, the, you only really wanna be pulling about three to four inches maximum through the, the cane, uh, through the weaving process, because it's gonna be binding up on you. It's a lot more forces because you're starting to fight a lot of strands. So I'm gonna come over here, go down through that hole. What time do you have? Kind of. Other thing, uh, the booklets that I got, the first time I got a booklet from, uh, to um, and give me instructions on this, it was not too helpful. Uh, Cindy went to the library. The library had a very good book on uh, on how to we do a chair or weave chairs, and it had a section on caning. And I've printed off that and have used that ever since. That booklet that I showed you is one I just bought. 
couple of weeks ago to see how good it is. It's much better than the one that I had originally had. So, so now I'm going to pull it through. Every vertical gets a second one and every horizontal gets a second one. Big in here. Now I would be clearing out all of these holes like I showed you with the all to make sure I have plenty of space, but in this, for the sake of uh, moving this on, I'm doing a lot sloppier job. Uh, and I'm feeding these to the forward. Like I fed the, the second row on the verticals to the right, I'm feeding these closer to me. And that's gonna be over here. I have not actually ever, um, I don't wanna say make a, made a mistake, but I've never, to my knowledge, woven incorrectly and not caught it on the spot. I'm sure, you know, that that's the worry <laughs> people have, but I, you know, I've never actually uh, noticed that I've made a mistake in the long run on the weaving process. Okay, so now I've got the verticals and the horizontals all in place. Um, now, if I had this entire field, you can see this doesn't look all that, uh, well, it's probably hard for you to see on the camera, but yeah, we'll just, at any rate, it, they're not looking all that good. So what you have to do with this whole field of the chair is come through and make everything pretty much parallel, make the ones that are supposed to be tight, tighter. You can do use your fingers, but honestly, it's gonna tear your skin apart or be rough on your hands. This method with using the end of the pegs works really well. And you'd try to make the, you know, you'd spend a half an hour or so actually going through this entire field of um, field of uh, weaving. And now that I, so now I've got it pretty much ready for the next level. And if you look, every single strand, there's over under, it's all woven in all directions. Even though I've only woven one direction, everything else is woven. So the, due to the layering, everything now, it's all over under, over under everywhere. So, so it's all ready to go. So the next step would be horizontal, the uh, diagonal steps. Now this, this step, like I said, it takes about a half an hour or so just to get everything squared up ready for the next step. So the first diagonal, I would start back here and generally work my way forward to the corner. And once you're, once you're actually in a hole or in, come out of this corner and get into the first square, then you're pretty much locked into how things are going to go. Now, I don't want to do start there. For today's demo, I'm going to start, just pick a hole over here that I think is going to be around about the right place to start the next, the diagonal. And what I'm gonna to wanna to do is capture this corner. So we're gonna put it there. And this is gonna be easy to mess up, good. So on my first diagonal, I want to go over the horizontals and under the verticals. So I'm gonna say that I'm gonna go over all of these horizontals. Obviously there would normally be verticals in there, but I'm gonna go over all of these horizontals and go under that vertical and over that horizontal. And that gets me my first diagonal. And I'm gonna just pick a hole over here to put it in. It's not good television to have uh, just the uh, work piece sitting in the camera all the time. So like I said, I go under, under the horizontals or over the horizontals under the verticals. So I'm gonna go over, under. Can't really see. Yeah, I know, but 
my hands have to do what they have to do. So, okay, so now I'm going weaving and I'm using the end of the strand as the needle basically to feed it over and under, over and under. And now it's getting pretty tight, even with this little bit, it's getting pretty tight. And you can see I've now got one of the holes has a diagonal on both sides. And these other two holes, I've got a di diagonal coming in. Let's see if I can get that to. Okay, so get that pulled taut. Now, given that you have to, uh, that you're going to get tired doing this uh, and take, want to take a break, uh, the, while you're not doing the work, it's going to dry out, say, if you leave it overnight. Uh, so the next day, you want to come in and uh, start, like, first off, wet down the seat. And I wet down the seat from the top with, uh, with a washcloth that I showed you. And then I turned the seat upside down and I wet down all of the um, knots and the loops. And then I, um, then I um, put the washcloth on the underside of the seat and leave it there for 10 minutes or so. You don't wanna leave it too long because it actually will get, it, since it's already been wetted the day before say, you will, um, you could over wet it and it will loosen up the seat pretty much. Okay, come on. So, oh, gonna do the same weaving process. We're gonna go over the, over the horizontals, under the vertical. So we're gonna pick this one. We're gonna hit the next hole over and be going on that diagonal and establishing the, the other hole. Okay. And again, see, I've got no twist there because I've been handling the, holding the strand and stopping it from twisting on me. And I've got to do four on these diagonals in order to complete the pattern. All I can say, John, is I am glad I did not inherit a cane chairs from my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a, it's it's not a bad. Uh, it's kind of interesting. It's. It's a little bit fun to do and uh just a little huh? i mean it, it it certainly passes the time so then i'm actually in the last of the weaving process uh the other direction the other the other diagonal and so i should be i'm gonna i'm feeling the cane to see which way this one wants to go i don't think this one has too much It's better that way, I guess. And I would normally start this one at the right rear. So as I said, I would start here, would have started this last layer here and work my way back to the corner. And then I would start back and work my way to the front corner. Now I'm going to start the other diagonal and it would normally have started at this, at this way and work my way back. And then I'd come back and work my way forward. So let's see, I started in the one, two, three, fourth hole. One, two, three, fourth hole. So we'll do the same thing on both sides. So yeah, as far as the weaving process, when you've left it for a day or so, you really wanna have the new canes that you're putting in about the same moisture as the seat. And also when I'm doing the weaving, what I'll do to balance up and make sure that the canes are all happy with each other is I'll push down to kind of move the weaves, the, the canes around to get them all kind of happy and seated together pretty well. But this is, this is pretty tight right now and it's not even dry yet. By the time this thing is dry, it will be like a drum skin. I mean, it, it'll, you could literally, you know, go boom, boom, boom on it. So now I'm going to be going over the verticals and under the horizontals. So I'll go under all of these horizontals and 
hopefully over this vertical here and under the horizontal and over the vertical. And now I'm to the point where it's all overs over here. And you can see I'm since this demo, I've got lots of extra pieces of uh, a cane and, and so are the and pegs, lots of pegs uh, that I could normally have tied off at this point. But since I don't have a whole field of, of cane of, of chair, I don't really have that. So When you're doing an entire chair, how often would you tie off? Well, you know, you're eventually going to have to tie off every strand. Um, and it's kind of nice to keep them well organized. I'm going to switch this peg up for something else. Let's see. So do you tie off every end as you finish that strand? It's, it's kind of up to you. I mean, yeah, you, once you've got enough loops underneath, then you can tie off whenever you want. Going over, and I'm going to try to, can't, I'm going to start the next, be in the corner of the next hole. So I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to capture the hole that I got the last time. And then I'm going to be capturing one more hole on this one, which is all applicable to this. Uh, demo, but not so much for the real thing. You're basically doing the entire See, But it, it is helpful to notice that you're going one corner, one, one hole over each time, basically. Oh, you know, and that's actually one of the tools I didn't bring out here is needle nose pliers. Uh, that's another tool that I frequently use um, and is pretty helpful because like you say, you, you can't always do get at what you need to get at with your hands. And under the horizontals, over, under, over, under. And the beginning of the strand is kind of acting as my needle. You want to, um, you don't want, you want to discard that because by the time you're done doing this, you have uh, abused it pretty badly. So you don't really want, you want to make sure that that first six inches of strand is not in your chair. It's cut off as an, as an end, you know, and thrown away. So you can see how long it's taking me to do a, uh, to do this chair uh, with just four holes. And then you got to multiply out how many holes and how many strands I would actually be putting in. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good deal of time. Finish up here. And then I'm actually showing you some things that I did not see in any of the pamphlets or online videos that I saw. So there. Yay. <laughs> there is the last strand of my demo. Uh, so if I continue doing this through across the chair, both directions, we'd have now have a diagonal pattern and all told, all, you know, we'd have these little hexagonal holes or octagonal holes all around the, all around the chair. And hold that up, you can see that we've now got the four holes that have the pattern on all, you know, for those four holes. Point. So the final, after that, we'd tie off all of those loose ends. All these peg, pegs would go away. And then I'd take a piece of binder cane. Yeah, in fact, my recommendation on the binder, so here's the binder cane. It's thicker, it's heavier. I would leave it in the water for hours, basically. 
there's two ways to do this, to do the binding. So we'll pull all these pegs out because these wouldn't be here. So one method that I've never used is they put a peg, put the binder cane in here at the corner and come across to the other corner and you push your binder cane down in here and you'd have the other binder cane from the side going down in there and then they put a wooden peg in here. Holding the two. Holding the, holding the by ends of the binder cane and that way they don't have to try to do a 90 degree bend. Oh yeah. But I soak it for many hours <clears throat> and start say in here and what you do, you're doing is, you, I'm not going to show you, but you bring a strand up and over the, you, you cut the binder cane to be the same length as the perimeter with maybe a four inch overlap. Uh, and then you, you uh, start caning, say about here, say give myself some overlap for, so I'd start there, but I'd, I'd start further up and I'd start coming up with a weave of cane over the top and back down over back over the top and back down through the same hole. So there's this series of- This is a separate piece, right? Yeah, so this is a new set. So what you end up with- Oh, okay. So you end up with the binder cane running along the edge. And I don't know if, how well you can see it, but there is an over, a loop over the top everywhere. So what I do is back here in the corner, I force that uh, binder cane to make that 90 degree bend. It makes a little dimple in it, but if it's wet enough, you can get it to do that. And it leaves that kind of corner that looks like that instead of having a dowel in there. Okay. And this chair is a square chair. So I've had to do that at each and every corner. That is my demonstration. Oh my goodness. That is so interesting. That is amazing, John. Absolutely. That is so interesting.